So I'm going to talk to you about high crust for the next uh, half hour, and then I have a lab that's uh, about an hour as well. I don't think it'll take uh, too much time for both those things. My slides are very short, so I would encourage you to ask questions throughout. Um, usually there's lots of things to ask, and those are usually the, the good details come out from questions, so definitely stop me whenever you want. Okay, so uh, learning objectives, basically I'm going to talk a little bit about how we sort of do qualitative inference all the time, a function from taxonomy. I'll explain what I'm talking about there. Uh, then I'm going to talk about PyCrust, which is a method to predict function from 16S data. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some limitations really briefly of PyCrust and the major steps of doing a PyCrust analysis, which will lead into the tutorial. Okay, so far today you've talked about the 16S ribosomal RNA gene and basically you've all basically maybe got to this step where you are now been able to make an OTU table or you're getting to the point where you can make an OTU table from 16S data. And so you could use Chime or Mother to get to this table. And really just an OTU table is a simple table where you usually have samples as different columns and different OTUs um, as different rows. And then from there you do lots of fun things. You can uh, build PCA plots or maybe na make networks or there's a school tool that Rob Biko may have, Genghis, or whatever you're going to do. There's lots of visualization. But that OTU table is often that starting point for it. Okay, so that's a little recap. So what's in a name? So the real question is, is you can do this clustering of sequences into OTUs, right, at say 97%. Uh, and then the second part you would do is then assign taxonomic names to those things. So why would we want to do that? What do you guys think? Why don't we just use, you know, call them one, two, three, four, or maybe we, we come up with some simple solution to say this cluster is O2, one, two, three, four. Why would we want to give it a real name? Trick question. Sounds tricky, right? Any ideas? Yeah, in the back. For biologists. Okay. <laughs> and why, why would biologists want to name it? Right, so biologists are like, no, we can't use OTU names and we'll use like Latin names. Yeah, any other ideas? Uh, right here because first. Because there's function involved in the name. Oh, you're cheating. Yes, I know, that's right, right? Because I'm talking about function. There's function in the name. No, I'm just joking. Yes, all right. So when we say a name, we don't just say, okay, I know what that name is, but you associate other things with it, right? So um, if we thought about Halopharax, if you're really into bacteria or sort of extremophiles, and you would think, oh, those must be cool archaea, and I know that they live in really salty marshes or something. Or, you know, if you saw a Plocorcus pop up, you're like, whoa, what are they doing in the gut? That's kind of weird. And they must have had some lettuce or something because those are photosynthetic, and that's kind of odd. And if you saw maybe bacillus, you might think of spores, and spores are cool, and spores are bad, and all that fun stuff. And, and there's sort of new associations coming out as well. So if you ever looked at the obesity versus uh, obesity microbiome sort of research, acromantia, it's this genus that keeps popping up that might be really cool. And if you take it, you might lose some serious weight after you eat McDonald's food. So all of these names, you know, they have, they have things associated with them, and it's from our research, right? So we start associating certain things with it, specifically with pathogens. Um, and from that, you know, you can sort of do cool things. So there was this neat little paper in 2012. I used this paper quite a few years ago. I'm not on the paper. Uh, but it's funny, I use this slide, and then I end up hiring the first author like a year later, and I was like, that's where your name's from. It was so cool. But anyway, so in this paper, they, uh, they only did 16S profile, and they didn't do shotgun the genomics. And so they looked and just associated, you know, we know that this taxa is probably a nitrogen fixer, or we know that these types of bacteria are oxygenic for <coughs> anoxic uh, conditions. And then they use that information to sort of track their different samples over depth with, with that information. It's kind of like a poor man's, you know, poor man's uh, metagenome for functions, right? So you make these associations. And you discuss them. And if you look at any paper, usually that's doing 16S, they'll talk about, ooh, we saw an increase in this bacteria or a decrease in this bacteria. And then they'll say, and this other paper showed that this bacteria was doing something adults, right? So you associate function with 
with these guys. But it's very qualitative. It's not quantitative in any way. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk to you a lot more about metagenomics and about uh, doing uh, taxonomic assignment and functional assignment. But I just want to point out right now that when we do functional assignment tomorrow, you'll eventually get to a really similar table like with OTUs. So you'll have your columns of samples, and then you'll have some other functional category on your x-axis. And I'll go into more detail. So this, these are examples of cake orthologs, groups of genes with some sort of functional association to them. And then you do lots of similar visualization. This is supposed to represent sort of all that fun stuff you do afterwards, statistical analysis. And I guess what PyCrust does is it goes directly from your OTU table to give you your functional table without uh, having to do the metagenomic sequencing. So that sounds great, right? I mean, that sounds like a win-win situation. So PyCrust stands for that. I'm not going to read it. Um, so it was a paper that we published in Nature Biotechnology in 2013. Uh, it was a collaboration between sort of three major groups. So I was in Rob Biko's lab as a postdoc at the time, uh, and Curtis Huttenhauer's lab was involved, along with Rob Knights and lots of collaborators. Uh, and then Jesse and Zanveld and I were the two main uh, co-authors on the first co-authors paper on the paper. So there's a site just for PyCrust, and there's some documentation. Okay, so let's talk about how PyCrust actually works. Okay. So you can imagine if we have our 16S ribosomal RNA tree. tree. So each tip in this tree, this is a smaller tree, uh, each tip in this tree represents a single, say, sequence or OTU. It doesn't really matter in this example, but it's a thing. And we know that we, know that, uh, we have a sample 16S sequence. So in our sampling, we find that, oh, we've got this guy here out of the big tree. And this tree is about 200,000 tips probably now, if I had to guess. But some databases are bigger and smaller. So you can imagine that if you knew nothing about this guy, actually, let's just go to my next slide. Sorry. So what we're going to do is just zoom in on this section of the tree. So you can imagine if you had a particular uh, thing of interest. Actually, let me just back up one second for you. So if we had the genome, in the simplest case, say we had the genome for this guy right here. Actually, I should think it's even simpler. Say we had the genome for this guy right here that we just sampled, 100% identical. And we might guess then that, ooh, we know that this genome has, you know, this ortholog or this function and can do these different things. And we can maybe get an estimate of what is associated with that. And then you can imagine if we didn't have this genome, but if we had this genome over here, well, that's pretty close. You know, there's a little bit of distance here in some magical way. Um, maybe we could just take this genome as its proxy and we'll just use the nearest neighbor. So PyCrest sort of uses that idea and sort of extends the data. So in this toy example, we have a few different things going on. So this is for a single, uh, say, keg orthologer gene that we're looking at. And the number represents the copy number of that gene in the genome. Okay? So imagine your favorite gene, whatever it is. And so this genome has one, this genome has one, this guy has never been sequenced, so you're not sure on it. And this is our, our new genome that, or this is our new sequence, sorry, that we have sampled, but we don't have the genome. So what PyCrest says is it uses ancestral state reconstruction. So it's a, there's this whole series of cool phylogenetic tools out there that focus not on building a tree, but on using a tree to then do other cool things. So an ancestral state reconstruction basically tries to infer at different points and different ancestors in the tree from this trait information what was probably the most likely or the most probable or most parsimony approach uh, to figure out what was at each of these ancestral nodes. Okay, so from this information, the ancestral state reconstruction might say, you know what, it would give you this value, and it would give you this value, and it would say maybe this is one, maybe this is three or something, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then we take the average between those predictions to, make, to find out where it branches from, and then we also extend, based on this branch length, sort of a uh, confidence interval around that information. So the whole idea is we're using that information from the whole tree about that particular gene, and then we're trying to make inference about this guy, okay? So that's for one, one sort of function and sort of for one tip in the tree. So we basically compute that, and then we repeat that for all the functions we're interested in. And so we usually do, we usually use keg orthologs, but we could do pretty much anything. And for keg orthologs, there's around 8,000 functions. Uh, that number's gone up about 10 or 12,000, I think. Uh, 
no more than 10,000. And it doesn't matter. We repeat that over and over and over again for that one tip. And then what we also do is we pre-compute it for all the tips in the tree. So for all the green genes at 97%, we pre-compute that. And it gives us a profile now for every single tip in the tree of what we think the genome might look like with those values. Does that make sense? Sort of. Keg, yeah, we're going to talk about Keg tomorrow. So Keg is a functional database. Um, and I'll talk about it in a lot more detail tomorrow, but it's just a way to annotate the genes. I think that's a good holdover until tomorrow. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, so PyQuest does two major things. One is, who's thought about OTU tables and the fact that some genomes have more than one copy of a 16S gene tree? 16S gene. Who knew that? So, yeah, a few people, yeah. So genomes have, sometimes they always have at least one, but sometimes they'll have multiple copies. You can imagine then if you sequenced a community and you had a genome in there with four copies, then that's going to be overrepresented four more times than a single copy. Sounds like a really bad idea, right? Most people don't care. It's kind of weird. <laughs> so most people do O2 tables, and they don't worry about 16S copy number variation at all. It's just one of those things. It's really weird. Um, so there was a paper that came out right before PyCrust that showed that it's, it's important to probably do that, and they came out with a way to do it. And then when we were doing PyCrust, we said, oh, we could probably predict 16S copy number just as it's the same as we do with all of our other functions. So we actually estimate 16S copy number, um, and then we allow you to normalize your OTU table to take into account that problem with, with multiple copies of the 16S gene. So in that first step, basically what we have is our OTU table in the, in the first step. And we're basically now have our predictions here for every, for every OTU ID. Um, so these are predicted 16S copy numbers within that genome. Yep. Do you count that there's variation, like mutation between your copies of your 16S? Or you just assume that they're all the same? Uh, within the OTU? Yeah. Or, or in the genome? In the genome. Of one organism? <laughs> So within the organ, well, so usually a genome would only, there's a finite, there's a, let me see. So there would be a known num a number of genes, 16S genes in a genome. Okay. That might change between strains or species, is that what you mean? But what I mean is like, for example, in one little guy, yep. maybe it's like four copies are different from each other because there's mutation between the copies or. Oh, I see. <laughs> the difference in the actual 16S genes. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so that's another problem, but we don't try to fix that here. So that's actually just a problem that's even separate from 16S copy number. So the problem is that for some genomes, you have this 16S copies, and usually when you have multiple copies, they're really similar to each other, 99, 100%. But for some organisms, uh, like halopharynx, they can actually be quite distant, like 93 to 95%, which then you can imagine if you're trying to bin these things at 97%, that kind of is weird, right? So you have some of the sequences going to this OTU, and some going to this OTU, and they're exactly the same. That's a whole other problem so that we're not trying to deal with. But yeah, good stuff. Um, feature, feature tool to make. Anyway, so the whole idea is we have um, six nest copy number here, and we're basically just normalizing it. So really simply, we're just dividing our values from our OTU table by the number that's shown in red, and it gives us our normalized O2. <coughs> Does that make sense? Rocking. Okay. Sorry, so quick question. Yeah. Obviously, it makes sense here, but then why don't, why don't we just do that all the time? Do we not always normalize O2 tables? Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I don't know why people don't do it. Um, so, I, okay, so I'll come up to in the limitations a little bit, So, but I'll address it now. So, one of the limitations right now with PyCrust is that one, we're stuck on Green Genes database. And then the second major thing is that because notice how these have actual identifiers, so these are green genes identifiers. We just can't use de novo to use because we don't have any way to figure out where it is in the green genes tree. So one, we're stuck on green genes, and two, we're stuck on only reference picked OTUs. And so most people would agree that's a bad thing now, although when we published it, people were uh, raving about reference OTU picking. Um, so the problem is now is that if you did our method to normalize, you would be getting rid of your de novo to use, which isn't, that's kind of worse than not probably normalizing. So the other approach though by Steve Kemble, I believe works on de novo to use as well. And PyCrest will eventually if you want to wait six more months, but for right now it's stuck here. 
But yeah, I believe for sure people should do 16S normalization. I mean, the argument could be made that it's on predictions of the 16S copy number, but I would definitely bet, and old Steve Kemble really shows really clearly in his paper, we didn't really focus on in this paper, that predicted copy number is better than just ignoring the fact that there is copy number problems. So, I'm yes. sorry, Uh, the genome, yeah, so that was the, that was the tree thing I just did. <laughs> so the whole idea is, right, because you know that these certain tips in the tree have these certain copy number, and so you try to predict the ancestors, how many copies they probably had, and then you make a prediction based on that. All right? Great. Okay, so second step is where the little magic happens. So it gets interesting. So now we take our uh, normalized O2 table here, and we take our... Predictions. So now we have every single K ortholog, which I'll talk about tomorrow, but different gene clustering annotation as a column. And we do this sort of matrix multiplication A. So in this example, to get this value, so the result is that we now have this table where we have K functions by samples, and we say we have this 13 value, right? So that just comes from uh, multiplying this prediction by the Abundance of that O2, right? So there's 2 times 4 is 8, and then 1 times 1 is 1, which times 2 is 4, so you have 8 plus 1 plus 4 is 13, right? And so you're just basically doing that as a matrix multiplication across all the columns and rows here, so you get a full matrix like this. Does that make sense? I mean, the real hard part is coming up with this in the first place, which I sort of just explained, right? So this is all pre calculated. But when you're running the steps, it's really only doing this, and this is just a lookup table to figure out how to calculate this. And that's why we're using these green beans ideas, that way you can map your O2 table to our predictions here. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So that's great, that's how it works. And then I thought I'd just show some of the major highlights from the papers of sort of how we validate. So the whole idea was, we took uh, the HMP and some other uh, data sets, and we did 16S analysis on them, and then we ran PyPros. So we generated these really big tables, which is just represented here as a heat map, where you have different functions and, and different samples. And then you can imagine that then you took the metagenomics, so some of the samples in the HMP were both metagenomic sequence and 16S sequence. So then we used those same samples, and we said, and then we annotated them, which I'll talk about tomorrow, about how to do functional annotation with metagenomics. And then she asked, how well do those overlap, right? How well does the pie crust predictions overlap with the metagenomic predictions? And then we asked, you know, what's the accuracy? So that's the idea. So what we found is that when we look at, say, a PCA plot now, uh, this is just body sites, and then you would see that the colors of the body, the colors of the dots here are different uh, sample sites. And then all the triangles are pi crust predictions, and all the circles are the actual real shot gen sequencing. So we're using the real metagenomics as our sort of gold standard. Um, and what we see is that we see pretty good overlap with, for by body site anyway, that the uh, that the body sites are clustering with their appropriate body site. That's that's great. We also looked at specifically accuracy. So if you look at say human R correlation. We looked at different data sets, and for the human data set, uh, we get above, we get an average of about nine uh, R correlation with the accuracy. Uh, and then on the X axis, what's interesting here, so that each color is a different type of data set. And what we plotted here is the distance for each 16S to its nearest reference genome. So the idea here is that as you come out this way, it means that your sample is more diverse and is not well represented by genomes in the database. So you can imagine human gut samples, we have really good, pretty good reference genomes, and so we do really well, this is the five thoughts. And then if you take a really bizarre sort of metagenome, these are hypersaline and more really well documented, really odd samples, we plot them this way, and we do see our accuracy drop. So if you have some really crazy diverse thing that no one's ever seen before, then we can't predict it very well. So that's good. So, and sorry, back yep. to the, on the validation piece, so I'm going to say more. Obviously, the stool samples here from the HMP project, which yep. are all the uh, young, healthy adult 
Right. How do you think it would perform on other populations like kids in North America or some Amazon jungle tribe? I mean, I guess it's kind of coming back to what you just said now about what yeah. different it is. But what are your thoughts on that? So I'm guessing a lot of people have these kind of ideas. So. Right. So it, it tends to actually work on these crazy things that people. So at first we wouldn't really we didn't recommend it too much for soil, although soil did surprisingly well here in the test. Um, but what we do put out is this nesty value. So the nice thing is that this plot's not perfect because it's not a perfect correlation, right? But what you can get when you run your samples is this nesty value. So it tells you, based on the genomes in the Green Genes database, not genomes in reference genome databases, sort of, sorry, but the as the nesty value increases, that means that your sample is more diverse and not well represented by genomes, by reference genomes. Okay. So some people sort of use this as a determinant of whether pie crust actually act is actually pretty good. The problem is it's not a perfect correlation, so you could have a nesty value of say 0.2 or so, and then does that mean you're getting sort of soil nice 0.9 correlation, or are you getting like you know 0.4? And so there's a lot of variance there around that. So we, so we mid mortals are able to to generate plots like that. We not. You could, yes, in theory. Well, no, because this is accuracy on the y and y axis. What you get out of your samples is you get a whole bunch of nesty values. And then you could say, well, OK, I got a nesty value of 0.3. That's off the scale there. We really shouldn't trust that prediction at all. Whereas this one's over here, we should trust it more. OK. Anything else on that? OK, so then we looked at sort of per genome predictions. So we just looked at, say, if we leave one genome out, and then try to make the prediction for that genome, and then compare the accuracy. We did that analysis. And we thought that we'd actually see more variation around the tree. So this bar on the upside is the accuracy um, for each particular species that we tested. And we thought we'd see branches, say, for sure in our kia, that would, we expected this to really drop down more. And um, surprisingly, that stayed pretty consistent. We do see dips going around um, areas where you sort of have these longer branches. And then you do see the accuracy drop down, but we didn't see what we expected maybe where there might be areas of the tree that are not well represented and we would see a, a sharp decrease. So that was interesting. And then last thing on sort of validation was then we asked, well, what types of functions do we do better or worse at predicting? And so this is at sort of a sort of high level. So this is looking at keg pathways. So this is grouping those keg orthologs into more general functions. And overall, we do see that the accuracy is really still pretty high. So even though you see, you do see some weird variation, not weird, you see different variations. So like central carbide, uh, carbohydrate metabolism is a little bit lower, but we're still pretty much around 0.9 or higher. So it didn't seem to really matter too much on these functions. The keg doesn't have a great representation of things like mobile genetic elements or say antibiotic resistance, unfortunately. So we did use another one, uh, another functional annotation system called the SEED. And when we did that, we did show that the annotation that we did see a drop in prediction for things that are really known to laterally transfer. And then we would then expect that 6NS doesn't do a very good job of predicting it. So, or you just see a lot of, within strains, uh, things changing really rapidly, like say pat virulence factors and things like that. Yeah. Uh, for the functions, the functions were, um, yes, this is only HMP data. I'm, s I'm almost 100% sure on that one. Yeah, so um, I don't think we looked at functions from some of the other samples. I think we stuck with the human samples on that. I can check, though. Okay, uh, this is kind of promo when we were first coming out with it, but one of the cool things we really did was we took the whole HMP, and they at the time had 6,431 16S samples and only this many metagenomes. And we basically ran it on pie crust, and it only took 10 minutes, and all of a sudden we had all this cool metagenomic data. So in the paper, you can look, and we did some new analysis that pulled out some biological relevant details. Uh, but I won't get into those. And then the other thing that we sort of looked at, which isn't super relevant, but I think it's, it's kind of interesting, is we asked, you know, if we, use, if we use metagenomics as our gold standard, you can imagine if you don't do very deep metagenomic sequencing, 
that's not getting close to what the real gold standard is. So in this case, we took samples where we rarefied, the red line shows where we rarefied the metagenomics, and you see that as we rarefy it, we start getting uh, further away from the accuracy. So the accuracy goes down as we rarefy the metagenomics compared to itself. Uh, but what's kind of cool with 16S is basically our accuracy stayed flat right across. Uh, and then where the lines cross, it means that the podcast is actually doing better. So this doesn't really apply to any data sets now, but at the time that was uh, thought to be uh, around 72,000 reads. Of course, we're doing way more than 72,000 reads in a metagenome. But uh, funny enough, in the uh, in 2013, there were still quite a few in NGRAS that actually had less sequencing than that uh, per metagenome sample, which suggests that those people who just ran PyCrest on their 16S data did actually closer to the uh, to the real value. 16% of existing metagenomic projects, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I did mention a couple of limitations early, so I just want to readdress those again. This isn't in your things because I realized I didn't put them together, so I already mentioned them briefly, but uh, it's currently based only on reference OTUs, so if you do open reference uh, OTU picking in Chime, then you can use PyCrest, but you basically have to filter out all your de novo OTUs, right? And then do your prediction off that. So that's not super satisfying, but it is what it is. It uh, currently only works with the Green Genes database, so if you're using Silva or RDP, tough love, I know, crap. Um, and it only works for 16S data right now, so uh, people have asked about what happens if I have 18S or ITS, could we get some functional predictions? Um, and people have been asking about that since the start, and I thought it was crazy a while ago, but I think we might give it a shot, maybe for things like yeast or something, but I'm, I'm a little scared on that one. Uh, and then the last one I just want to mention really quickly is when you get these, and this is more to do with functional databases, is you'll get these weird pathways coming up from KEG about I have predicted, predicted things that, you know, these genes are associated with some disease like cancer or something. It makes absolutely no sense. And it's kind of a weird technical reason. So it has to do with the fact that KG orthologs are annotated both with sort of gene, human gene annotations and microbial gene annotations sometimes. And so a few things can happen. One is you could just get distant homology. So your genes get annotated sort of poorly to some gene that's mostly in humans, and it's you know it's only say 40 to 50 percent identical. That's a bad example, but that sometimes happens. Uh, but more likely is that genes that do have homologs in people just get associated with disease in people, but those genes do something completely different in microbes. So anyway, long story short is that's all right. It just means that don't try to say that the microbes are causing disease or like some sort of cancer, whatever those annotations are, because it's just an artifact of the database itself, of the K database by itself. Okay, so those are the main, lim main limitations. Sorry, on that note though, yep. can I ask, when you're addressing the question that I've puzzled with a lot when people are asking for cross data, um, understanding which of the functions I should completely ignore and which ones, and the obvious ones like I found Alzheimer's just, yeah. Odd. I ignored that, but yeah. I didn't understand why it was there. Well, there's this yeah. whole, yeah. Then I found things like um, upregulation of the renin angiotensin system. I, I guess I ignored that as well. Because I'm not microbiologist, I thought, wow, maybe there's something going on with that. I had no clue about it. But to me, that's about hypertension and kidney. Yeah, that would actually be a really useful database, but that's not what's going on. So the all those, there's these, um, so there's different ways to group the kegs, the keg orthologs. And one of those groupings at the highest levels is called diseases or something, something very general like that. So if you look at your pathways and then just basically remove all those, those, as far as I know, are all having to do with human associated, how the genes are related in, in people and have nothing to do with the microbes. Uh, so repeat that again. So, so there's the highest denomination of these diseases, then get just, just Yeah, you just can throw those pathways away. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I should just remove them myself. I know, again. TLC needs. Okay, so the cool thing is, is um, okay, so the major tutorial pipeline is uh, you're starting actually with an OTU table with, that's already been made with green genes IDs. You can get there too from either Chime through this pick close reference OTUs, or you can get to it through the open reference OTU picking and you filter them out. There's an explanation somewhere that explains that. 
Uh, Mother has this tool as well that lets you sort of make uh, a biome file which has green beans and IDs. It's a little tricky, but you can get to it. Uh, but the tutorial, tutorial focus is mostly on this stuff. So you're going to take that OTU table, you're going to correct the 16 copy number, get an OTU table. You're going to predict its metagenome and get take words logs. You're going to collapse those into take pathways. And you can push all those into a cool uh, a tool called SPAM. Okay, so tomorrow, you have me all day, so get used to it. But tomorrow, um, I'm going to discuss what stamp is and a gentler introduction. I'm going to talk about how these work logs get grouped into pathways. The tutorial today is mostly meant just to give you an idea of how to do this, and it's going to make hopefully more sense tomorrow. And the tutorial has two major sections. One is this, and then it says optional. You can do this stuff in stamp if you want. If you're just like blazing through, sure, give it a whirl. But it would probably be a lot better to leave that stamp part till tomorrow when you have some extra time, okay? So I think for today, it's best just to focus on the first steps to where you actually make the different O2 tables. You open up just with like a text editor and you can sort of see what's going on. Does that make sense? All right, yeah, Next question. Do you know the slide where it says the pie-prosecuted Yeah. This guy here. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to understand the math and stuff on the pie crust, the pike predictions table, like the 412. Like, how do you, how, how are those numbers? Yeah, I, yeah, I can never explain this well. I know it's really tricky. <laughs> so, okay, so this is the table. I know this is what we're really trying to get to. So, this is coming back from this tree thing. And maybe once, maybe going back in time helps. So, to get that table, we basically say for one particular K thing we're going to look at, right? So you can imagine, say we're trying to predict uh, these across all these different OTUs, okay? But what we're actually just interested in is say is this number right here. This one, this one right here. So we're trying to figure out how many of these copies is in this particular OTU. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to show in this tree. So basically, we're using in all the other information with all the other genomes associated with other sources in the tree. So what we're trying to do is fill in this hole in the in that table, and to do that, we map reference genomes, right? So there's big databases of reference genomes that people okay. already sequence genomes, and we go in those genomes and say, oh, well, in this genome we have four copies, and in this genome we have one. one and two. Okay, so that's known information, and then we're just trying to use a method to predict what we think is in here. The simplest case is you could just say, what's the nearest neighbor? We actually did that in PDP pretty good <laughs> without doing all this ancestral state reconstruction. You can just say, oh, this one's actually closer. Uh, yeah, sort of Sorry, yeah, you, you had explained that. I just thought it was referring to the OTU copy number. Okay, right. So this is referring to the category. Yeah, this is both actually. Okay, so, so you use it for both. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Cool. See, All right. it doesn't really matter, so in the heart of the podcast, it doesn't really care what these things are. It could be K-Worth logs, it could be, it could be anything. And so in one thing we say, okay, in the simplest case, yeah, it could be six times copy number. So that's one of the traits that we try to predict. And then, and then we just put it in. Okay? Great. Any other questions? Okay, so give the tutorial a whirl. The tutorial's on sort of a, there's a link to it, and it's on a slightly different website, which I'll talk about tomorrow as well, about Microbiome Helper. This is just like a little small section until tomorrow. Okay, so again, you can raise your hands or use the sticky notes, I guess, for questions. Yeah? So if you theoretically knew um, like all the genomes for every species in your you would theoretically, this is more of the, like the Novo, the species that we have, we don't, we don't have. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, you could imagine the simplest case, you know, if you had perfect all the genomes, you would just blast your 16S against the database of those genomes, and then you would just do this yourself, right? It's kind of looking after that overhead and trying to figure out the best way to do that prediction. So yeah. that will, will theoretically get better as we sequence more genomes, okay. yeah. And absolutely, so we're trying to make it a little bit more flexible so that at the time, 
well, it just changes really quickly. So now people are going out and they're actually doing some genome sequencing or culturing right on a particular environment that they're interested in. And then they're asking, you know, can I use those genomes really quickly because I don't want to put them in, well, they're not in NCBI yet or whatever. How do I incorporate those? So we're trying to make that more flexible. And then the other big one is, is, um, is more challenging, but is metagenomic data or something, right? So if you have a metagenome already for that sample, can you use maybe, can you pull out genomes from those metagenomes and then use those to help guide your 16S prediction? But that's, that's in the future for a PhD student of mine, so we'll see how that goes. But 